As I was reading this, uh, this church in overseas, every Friday they, uh, they go out and feed people. Now so, <laughs> huh? She says, now I remember. I read that. As I read it, I was reading it. Deke said, I think we need to go out and uh, do what? Go to, go to, um, McDonald's and buy food for the homeless people. For the poor people. Now it, it doesn't necessarily have and to I be. I almost didn't tell him that. And the Lord said, tell him now. And so I told him. Well, thank you. What did I say last week? I said two weeks ago about what I wanted to do. What's that? That's right. Okay. That's, the That's exactly right. I'm all been Thank you, Deke. I appreciate it. Love you. So let me tell you what happened. Yes. Do you remember last year? Remember last year at Passover when the lady CC came in the storehouse and started prophesying for 30 minutes? And she said that we were going to have a ministry. She saw, saw me standing there stirring a pot and that God was going to give us a food ministry. Right. Yes. Right now, started yesterday, I'm building a kitchen. Yeah. Outside kitchen. An outside kitchen. Let me tell you what I saw. Let me read it to you. This is this is amazing. All of these confirmations. <laughs> I see you, Doug. You good? You want to say something? That's good stuff. Man, everybody kind of jumped on that bandwagon really quick, huh? I mean, beyond, let me tell you what, he, what the Lord spoke to me. Um, and um, This is what I wrote. Um, the Lord said, I was, I was talking to the Lord. He was reminding me of what went, would happen. Um, the Lord said, um, if you want, if you want them then, then you need to begin to feed them now. This is what he told me. Because, and what I'm talking about is, there's some times coming in our not so close future, which I believe we're on the, we're actually walking through the door of it right now. I don't believe we have a year. I don't believe, I think it's even less than that. We're about to see some things, so I'm going to tell you where I'm at, what, what the Lord was speaking to me. The Lord said, if you want them then, begin to feed them now. Once a month, take the Saturday breakfast and make it a Saturday outreach. Begin on June the 6th. Confirmation, June the 6th, to feed the people. June is the 6th month, the 6th day. That's 6-6, six, six, that's 66, that's the Word of God, the 66 books in the Bible. I was reading the, I was reading the magazine to feed the people. Deke said, feed the people. Cherie said, a soup kitchen. 
and every and my wife stirring the pot. But it, 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 this is what the Lord wants us to do. Now watch. This is the reason that it was pushed back because 66, 66 books in the Bible. God has called us to feed the people, not only physically but spiritually. Feed them the Word. So. He said, begin on June the 6th. Confirmation uh, number one is June is the sixth month, and it's the sixth day. There's 66 books uh, in the Word of God. He told me, go different places every month. So that means that we're going to pick out a spot every month. It's not going to be in here. So we won't be here once a month. If you come looking for the church, it's gone. You better find out where the church is at. Because the church is going to be feeding the people. He said, go different places every month. I will lead you. Um, and you'll, uh, you'll now begin to feed my people. And I will bring you the ones uh, to feed then. I'll bring you the ones to feed then. As I am reading this morning in the church, um, I'm writing this, so the Lord is speaking it to me, and I wrote here, as I'm reading uh, this morning, um, this magazine, um, it was about going out to feed the poor. At that very precise moment, Deke said, I think we should go out and feed the poor. The Lord said, anyone who is without me is poor. Feed my people. You bankrupt without Jesus Christ. That's right. You bankrupt. He told me, keep it simple. Like hot dogs and chili. That's all you want. At that moment, I saw John. Let me tell you what I saw. I saw a trailer with a food thing on it that we pull around every month wherever we go. And God's got you building a kitchen. So I think you need to pray about that kitchen. If it's supposed to be in a building or it's supposed to be on a trailer. That's what I felt like on wheels. And then God reminded me, if, if you remember the Lord give me two words, two names for this church. Wow. Restaurant. I was going down the road when God told me to open the church. Going at first, I was going, I was coming back from home with my wife in the car, and I'm like, "All right, Lord, if you want me to open the church, what do you want me to call it?" Instantly, I heard the restaurant. I'm like, "Do you want me to call the church the restaurant?" We do have a chef here today too. I'm like, the restaurant. So we, uh, I told my wife, and she's like, We'll have our bulletins that'll look like menus. We'll have our bulletins that'll look like menus. That's what she said. So then I'm going to Hattiesburg. And, you know, I'm like, you know, Lord, what do you want me to name the church? Call it. Again, he said the restaurant. I'm like, oh, no. I mean, come on, Lord, you, the restaurant? Well, um, shortly after that, he gave me the name for the church. It was called the Citadel. You know, and I always kept it within me. What is the deal, Lord, with the restaurant? What is the deal? You know, it's now. And let me tell you why. Because... The things that are coming, this church is preparing for, so that in the hard times, we're going to be able to feed the people, the restaurant. But the Lord said, you have to start now. So the first Saturday, is it the last Saturday or the first Saturday we do it? Every, the last Saturday of every month, we will no longer be meeting in this building. We will have a place picked out, whether it's, you know, this week I know, it's, um, or next week I know, um, on the 6th, it's Flint Creek. So we're going to have, we need to have hot dogs and chili to feed the people that's out there, whoever wants it. I know that people come out there and they bring food and all that, but there's a lot that's going to be out there, I'm going to tell you, that just go out there and they leave there to go get something to eat. A lot of them, uh, the, the bring their kids and children swimming out there. They don't have a lot of money. That's why they go there. Well, guess what? We're going to have a hot dog stand. <laughs> 
And you know what? That's what we're going to do. We're going to feed them hot dogs. And we're going to have a little, you know, we're not going to advertise a big church or anything like that. I don't want to do that. I just want to have something, you know, on a, a, a card. Maybe we can get cards made up that just simply says, you know, may the Lord bless you. You know, uh, something. We're going to have something that we're going to come up with that we can just hand out. If they want any further information, you know, what church we attend, they'll come to us and ask us. You understand? But this church, you know, is going to begin to feed the people every Saturday. I'm excited. I don't know where the money's going to come from. Yes. Also, if you remember when the Lord, right before the Lord had us close the thrift store down, and uh, the, the house fire had happened, and, and we were praying about when we were supposed to close the thrift store, and uh, Ron, who we get the barrels from, Carl's neighbor, right. came to us and kept saying, I see but, you ought to have a food truck. Why that's you? right. I'll give you all the information you need to do like a restaurant type food truck. You can park it right here. And, and I think what we can do is, what we'll begin to do is, we will... Um, Yes, go ahead. You're about to fall out the seat. Tell me. No. <laughs> make some chili, that's all. Yeah, make some chili. Award-winning chili. Oh. Award-winning chili. Man, we could put that on a... Look, we're going to get a banner made for the trailer and have it on the trailer. So award-winning chili or whatever it is, and we can have things posted on that trailer that promote Jesus Christ and and what we've come to do. No cost. Award winning chili. Award winning chili. You can do the cards? Alright, good deal. So this is what he said. He told me keep it simple, hot dogs and chili. And and bottled water, yes. So we're going to have kosher dogs too, huh? <laughs> we got all kind of dogs, yes. I told my wife that being early in the summer, I expected the barbecue pits to be at a premium. So we got hot dogs with chili in our freezer. Well, he chili, went but for the hot dogs six. Fun he said, I six. said, we should get hamburger. He said, no, we'll, we might not be able to get a grill. We got a little grill. He said, we'll do hot dogs and chili. Awesome. <laughs> Hot dogs and chili is easy. We can, you know. So, this is what the Lord told me. A new direction, says the Lord. That's what I'm giving you now. Be faithful. Amen. And you know why I said that? Because if we're faithful now with it, He'll be faithful to, to us then. That means He's going to bring those that we're going to be able to feed later. Not only are we going to be feeding them now, and I'm sure people are going to come to know the Lord, you're going to see miracles begin to happen. I guarantee it. You're going to see it because we're going to be out there as a church. And, you know, I'm thinking about places, you know, it's Flint Creek. Maybe we'll hit another, we'll hit parks. Because we know in the summertime there's plenty of people in the parks all over the place. You know, so that's, we'll just begin to seek the Lord. Where's the next place to go, Father? And we got parks we can do. We got, you know, wherever the Lord calls us to go. That's what we're going to do every Saturday. I mean, not every Saturday. Once a month. Once a month. The last Saturday of every month. Rebecca reported in the bulletin. Last Saturday of every month. He gave you new direction on the day of Pentecost, the time of crossing over. Amazing. Yeah. Hey, go ahead. Um, like that time that me and Larry went to the and they had that woman, she was a homeless lady there, and you know, me and Larry both were kicking the racks and stuff like that and drink. And when I walked home, I think I told you already when we got ready to leave, and I walked after her, and I still had kicking them over the racks, and the Lord said, Wow, that's another good place we can go. We can hit the coast. Pull the trailer to the coast. John, we've got to do something. Yes. Before, just this beginning of this week, the Lord pressed me to bring my grill, so if anybody needs to use the grill, I have a gas grill. Oh, good. So you can put pots on it, too. Awesome. You know, I've been, um, I've been uh, asking the Lord, 
you know, what can I do to feed, what can I do to make an impact, to do something? You know, I'm just tired of having church as normal and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it, it, it's time at the church that we get out. We have to be seen. Um, and I want to tell you something today. It's Pentecost. I'm not going to hold you, but I want to share something with you. I think uh, I want to share something with you that I know um, that has really uh, impacted me in a big way. Um, who's in nursery in that today? Mom. Mom's in nursery and, and uh, yeah, you could take the kids, Mom. Yeah, the older ones can stay. Yes. The first time is going to be. So are we going to do it again? Yes. The last Saturday. We're going to double up. Two, uh, it's going to be established. A witness in June. Good to see you, Joe. I found your post hole digging in my shed. Oh, that's all right. Brand spanking new. Ain't been out in the rain or nothing. Oh, no. I've been thinking about that post hole digger, Joe, forever. So I, back in the truck. I like your haircut. You look good. <laughs> <laughs> and good to see. I, I heard all about your water deal. Oh, man, look. Well, listen, we came I'm here I'm and said a lot of water. If your water bill is high, it's because I come here and fill up about 30, 20 jugs of water. Cause that's, and let me tell you something. Four days without yeah. water, we yes. prepare yes. for what's coming. You got a good... So a good you a well off four days. <laughs> you in trouble. Wow. Big so we're in big time trouble. We all, thank God everything turned out all right. Had a lot of help. I'm going to go uh, Charlene and then um, Carol, and then I'm going to start the message real quick. I'll make it short and sweet. I have a friend who is a born again uh, Christian's dad, who's a pastor in Jerusalem. He gets a snow cone card, and he might let us pay him. For he has a what? Snow cone card. A snow cone card. Most wonderful snow cone card. I think, yeah, be nice if we had, an, uh, had a truck, I mean, uh, no, I like a trailer, I like the trailer idea. You got the ministry trailer. Um, Carol? Uh, I'm taking something that the Lord has laid out my heart a few weeks ago, I really been thinking about it, and I want to come to the homeless and all that, take that's exactly right that is absolute my sister does that uh, my sister does that and um, she's got a big group of people that does that and in, in church and up there in New Orleans and that's what they carry it around in that car and whenever they see them they just take the bag out and it's got you know it's got a um, just the necessities, the basic necessities. But anyway, guys, it, it's so good to see you. Um, I want to share something with you. I think this, what I'm going to talk to you about today, is the crowning of what God has, uh, has I, I've been speaking to you guys on the book of Revelation um, about the churches and what was going on and what was happening during that time, really breaking it down in a big way. Um, and then I went, you know, uh, to Tennessee for a week. Um, and normally, every time I go up there, the Lord speaks to me. He, he spoke to me again, point blank. And while I was up there, the six days I was up there, um, I actually, um, I read two books while I was up there. And they were both by Corey Ten Boone. And Corey Ten Boone was, you know, in World War II. She was in a concentration camp for 11 months. Um, this is the way the Lord led me. If you guys remember, the night, uh, it was a Monday night, the last Monday night that we was, right. remember we uh, usually had been feeding the, the college students over there on Mondays. Um, and the last Monday night, we wound up having it here, and I showed some things that was happening, meaning that exactly what happened in Germany is repeating itself to the T right now in the United States. That's right. And everything is fixing to change in a, in a drastic way. Um, I've been for a long time now, since January of last year, 
when the Lord spoke to me directly to speak to the church to prepare for what's actually coming. Uh, the majority of you guys probably, or, or some of you guys wasn't here then, but, um, uh, but a lot of you were. Um, the time that we're moving into right now is unprecedented from any other time that we've ever seen or that we've ever faced. And I took it, uh, the Lord had put it on my heart to begin to prepare the people, number one, first spiritually, and then number two, physically. Um, well, when I had went up to uh, Tennessee, um, the Lord gave me a third thing. And that's what I want to speak to you today about. And I believe it's the final thing. The first thing I spoke to you guys spiritually is that you need to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Because what's coming, if you don't know Him, you know, all the physical preparations that you do is useless. Because, you know, without Jesus, you're lost. Um, and you're not going to be able to endure what's coming. Amen. Um, when I'd left and I went up there, I started reading a book, and it was it was called The Hiding Place by Corrie Ten Boom. She was actually in prison uh, from February uh, February 28th, 1944, to December I think 27th or 28th of 1944. She was 11 months in uh, three different uh, camps. Um, actually, she was in prison first for four months, and then she was moved to two different work camps. Um, she was a Christian. She was a watchmaker. Her father was a watchmaker. She lost her entire family um, to Germany in the rise of Hitler, and when they came in, she was Dutch. And um, when she was carried off into the prison camps, I learned something from her I never, uh, I never seen before. I didn't experience it. And what I mean by it is that I read the Word of God and we know that we see the suffering and the persecution. We hear about how all the disciples were martyred, you know, and I got that from the Fox Book of Martyrs, how they all died, you know, the persecution they had to go through. Um, and then I've been reading to you Revelation, the letters that's been going on in the book of Revelation. And in that, how uh, each church, Jesus, when he was talking to John, they had to endure. He says, yes, I see what you're going through. And he commends him. And then he says, but yet, you know, um, there's a few things I have against you. That time that he's writing this letter to these seven churches, this is a time of great martyrdom. I mean, and he actually even speaks about it. That's the time that you and I are now moving into very shortly. Very, very shortly. And we could talk about it. And, you know, yes, I would die for Jesus Christ if somebody walked in here and said, you know, would you die for Jesus? You know, probably everybody in here would raise their hand, you know. But I want to uh, share something that I learned from Miss Corey Ten Boone. When she was... The first two years when... Uh, when her town or city was actually taken over, she hid away Jews in, in which is called the hiding place. She had a wall made up in an upper room and she hid Jews for two years. And she was sold out by a friend, by an acquaintance. And her and her family was taken to prison. Her daddy only lived 10 days and then he died. Uh, he actually died in the hallway of a, of a hospital. Um, Corey Ten Boom, when they came and got her, she was sick, very, very bad, very sick. Um, and they quarantined her for four months by herself. She said that was the greatest and most, that was the hardest time that she had ever had to face being alone by herself. It was the first time she was ever alone in isolation. And um, not saying the other stuff wasn't hard, but as I began to read the book, I went there. You can watch the movie, but it doesn't have anything on the book. You haven't went there if you watch the movie. If you read this book, you'll go there. And I want you to think about something because I believe this is the crowning of our preparation, you and me. And you need to pay attention and listen very, very closely. Because 
I never thought about I never thought about it like this before. When Corey Ten Boone was uh, after being in isolation for four months, they brought her and placed her on a train. Her and you know uh, thousands of other women. Well, the train cart that they put her in was only was supposed to hold about 40 people, and they jammed about 80. So literally, when you're standing up in a train cart, they were so smushed in there that you could lift your legs and you wouldn't fall down. That's how packed it was in that train cart. They couldn't even sit down, so they devised a way that they could sit down, and the way they sat down was um, the first lady sat down, and then right between her legs, she sat, and the next one sat, and that's how they sat in that car for four days, without food or water, sitting in feces and urine. And prior, when they was getting into the car, that wasn't the first, that wasn't a brand new cart that they was loaded up in. That cart was used many times. In her camp alone, 96,000 women died. 700 women a day was either worked to death or killed every single day. When they got out of the train cart, out of the cart, um, they was marched a mile and a half in the rain, in the slop, in the freezing cold, to stand outside of this concentration camp for three days to wait while they was being booked in. Not only in the mud and the water, but the place was infested with fleas and lice. They were covered with fleas and lice. As they was booked in, they were stripped of all that they had um, and then placed into a, a, a dorm, if you want to call it, where in this dorm, it, the max holding that it could hold was 200 women. They had 700 women jammed up into that place. 700 women. Their bunks was actually just big massive um, uh, beds built up that was just big and wide. Each bunk held about 40 women. There was about 80 to 100 that was on each. She said there was only, that it only gave us inches if you really laid us out. They was actually stacked on top of one another. It was so infested with fleas and lice that they could shake and knock the fleas and lice off of them like that in that bunkhouse that they stayed in. Every morning at 4.30 in the morning, they was marched out in the freezing cold below 30 degrees, nothing to wear, hardly. Stood out there for three hours waiting on a roll call of 700 women. And if one of the women didn't come out, which on the average 40 women died every day in her just overnight, then they had to wait to go verify to see that that person was there. So on average they stood three to three and a half hours outside, freezing cold. And then they was marched a mile and a half to a work area where they worked 11 hours. And then they was marched back a mile and a half where they could actually go into the dorm. It was here that a woman of God and her father and her sister and her family decided to take Jews in and protect them from the Nazis and being betrayed by some friends of theirs or a friend of hers, an acquaintance she knew very well and was helping. She's placed in a, uh, she's placed in a concentration camp. Now remember that she's a Christian and while she's there there are people that are in there asking her, oh, you're a Christian? Well, where is your God? Is this what he intended for you? Do you have that kind of faith to endure? Would you be able to be loaded up on a train cart, sit four days in feces and urine, in the camp that they had, which was just a mere wooden building, 
They had eight toilets for 700 women, and the feces was overflowing everywhere, but yet remained faithful. A bullet's easy. A guillotine's easy. But you get in a circumstance like that, four months in isolation, your mind starts going crazy. No Bible, no Word. The only thing you have is what's within you. Her ministry began, her ministry began as the war started, started taking the Jews in. Then her ministry, she was able to sneak a Bible in. Long story, you need to read this book. She was able to sneak a Bible into the concentration camp, and when they was going in, her sister, Betsy, you know, when they're going in, they walk into the camp house, and there's fleas and lice. It's an infestation, and Betsy is the one that was just so full of love. She said, Corey, we have to thank God for the fleas and the lice. And Corey Ten Boone's like, I, I, Betsy, I cannot thank God for the fleas and the lice. But she snuck a Bible in. And come to find out, when she come back from her first work day, she goes into the camp house, the concentration camp, should I say. Well, the guards wouldn't come in. And when they walk in, they like, we were so guarded out there. Why, why the guards won't come in here? And the women said, it was because the fleas and the lice. And they had a Bible study every morning and every evening, twice a day. They was able, with that Bible that she had snuck in, you got to hear her testimony. You know how many people she was able to witness to her and her sister in that concentration camp? Women that were stepping off and dying every single day. After being 11 months in the concentration camp, she's released. She gets out, but her sister Betsy dies, her father dies, her cousins die, and her whole entire family. She was left without one relative. They all paid the price. This is where the Lord really began to work on me. And while I was up there, I read this book. And then I had to go get the other one. It was called A Tramp for the Lord. It's called Tramp for the Lord. It's not the tramp that you think of. It's about tramping around the earth for the Lord. 33 years of ministry after coming out of the concentration camp. An amazing book. I read it too. Not only read it while I was up there, but my wife and my mom and my family and I, we watched even the story, the actual story of Corey Ten Boone that you can go on, you know, YouTube and you can watch the story. But let me tell you something, it, it isn't anything, it doesn't touch the book. Because in a book it gives you details. Um, and then in The Tramp for the Lord, it gives you, she gives you more details of things that had happened to her while they was in there. The suffering was unbelievable that they had to go through. And I feel like this is what the Lord spoke to me. It was amazing how it wound up happening. You guys were here when we watched that movie and at the end of it, Corey Ten Boone come out and spoke and the Lord told me that Monday night while I was here, get her book and read it. Amen. And that's what I did. You guys, you and me, I understand a scripture now like I've never understood it before and I've got the understanding through Corey Ten Boone and I'm going to read it to you in a minute because it changed my world. And in fact, let me just read something to you. This is what I wrote. The book is called The Hiding Place. And Corey Ten Boone said that the real hiding place is in Jesus Christ. So it ain't so much about, you know, no matter where you're at, no matter where you find yourself, no matter what circumstance that you're going through, will your faith be able to endure? If you're loaded up on a cart, and taken to a place that is horrific. Even if you die there, is God any less of God? In fact, I want to tell you another thing. Come on, brother. That this Western mindset that we don't understand is that while she was in there, they didn't have the medicines like you and I have. And Betsy was very sick. And they prayed earnestly that Betsy would be saved, that she'd be healed. But guess what? 
There were people dying every single day that God didn't heal. Does that mean he's any less God? No. But you got to have it in your mind. You have to be fully persuaded, fully persuaded that no matter what you go through or where you're led to, you won't give up hope. Because while she was in there, often, you know, with the people that was coming in, look at your circumstances that you're in right now, and you're going to tell me there's a God in heaven? Did your God in heaven intend you to sit in feces for four days? Did he intend you to, you know, have all your clothes stripped off of you, ate up with lice and infested? Did he intend that? Did he intend 11 months of a concentration camp with you? Did he intend for you to walk over dead bodies and see 96,000 women die? You're telling me that your God in intended that for you? That there's a God in heaven? It would be easily to give up. Amen. But Paul said, you need to be fully persuaded. Amen. Yes. Fully persuaded. I'm giving this to you from a heart, from a pastor. We're about to experience some things that you're going to have to endure. I don't know what it is. But you can't let your faith waver no matter what circumstance that you or me that we find ourselves in. And you know what Betsy said? They said, why don't you, you know, aren't you worried about the Gestapo and them coming in? She said, whatever I open my door to, God is allowed. Can you trust him that much? Did God call us to run and hide? Come on, brother. No, he didn't. If they would have ran and hide, or if they would have fought back, she would have never been able, her and her sister, to minister to countless of thousands of people that was dying every single day. We're already dead. Amen. Why try to save your life now? You're already dead. Settle that within you. Come on, brother. In me. Remember, he's ministering to me. I have to settle it within me because the actions that I take is going to dictate the, the, the way that I go and I choose to walk. It's going to affect people. Your actions are going to affect people. That's right. But if you could fully trust in the Lord... That no matter what happens, no matter where you find yourself, that could be in God's will for you. Come on. I remember I worked on a job I thought was going to be absolutely beautiful. I was working for a Christian man. Little did I know, he was the worst guy I ever worked for. But God wanted me to minister to him. Amen. That was hard. A year I went through. Not only me, my son... I left the company to go build a church. Amen. And the guy that I was working for was a Christian. And I had to endure. And through that time of, you know, checking up on me and peeking out on me and trying to get me to quit with everything, I mean, it was hell with this guy. God said, I want you to take your sword and go up there in his office in front of his big old desk. <laughs> They were freaking out in there. And I want you to tell him that he lost his hearing. I'm like, this man just threatened to fire me. And you want me to go in there and tell this man that he lost his hearing? I, I told him he broke down crying. I told him a message in the Bible about how Malchius lost his ear. I walked in there with a sword. The receptionist is freaking out, man. I'm telling you. I'm not joking. The vice president of the company thought I was there to kill the president of the company. He was scared. I was holding a sword. I had to give the president of the company the sword. Because he couldn't hear what I was saying. I walked in with a sword. You'd be freaked out too, right? <laughs> but I laid the sword on his desk. I told him the story about how Malchius lost his hearing. How Peter cut off the right ear of Malchius. 
This guy was a pastor at one time. And God wanted to tell him, you lost your hearing. Broke down crying. Got up, closed the door, wept. Began to open his life up to me. The next day I get a phone call. You know what he tells me? I didn't believe none of it. Guess what? It happened again. Wrote a letter. He was playing the harlot. I wrote a letter. I had to give that letter to somebody. And then he told me, I want you to take that letter to him. Because he's playing a harlot. I'm like, what? I'm not, I'm not going to have a job. I know it. I'm gone. Broke down crying again. Next day, rejected it. No. Let me tell you what he did the next day. He called me and my brother in to start a new job, to build a St. Joseph's, anyway, to build another job. I knew it all the way up there. He's firing me. The Lord had me load up everything that was part of that. I was a superintendent. I loaded the trail up and all the stuff. I was telling my brother, they firing us. He's like, no, they're not firing us. I said, yes, they are. God will put you in a place where you don't want to be. It's going to rub you all kind of different ways. But if you really want to be where it is and do what it is that God has called you to do, you need to grit and bear it and stick it out. Because He has a purpose for you. We get up there. Walk in His office. The vice president comes in with the president of the company. He's looking at me. I'm like, it's done. And he's sitting down behind the desk and he's, uh, um, well, I said, you know what? I said, listen, brother, just say what it is. It's all good. Because I already know what you brought me here for. My brother's looking at me like I'm crazy. The next words out of their mouth was, you know what, Rob? Oh, Joseph, you're not like us. You're not like us. You're not like one of us. You're different. You don't fit here. And I said, you know what, brother? I got up. I said, I appreciate you letting me work for your company. And I got up and I turned and walked out the door. My brother was still sitting on the sofa like this. <laughs> That's the God's honest truth. I stopped and turned around. I said, Jay, come on, let's go, man. Come on, let's go. And he's like, what happened? I said, exactly what I told you. But I learned sometimes God will put you in a place. Amen. You know, we're so worried about if we're not working around Christians or... God didn't call us to work around Christians. Right. He called us to be light in a dark world. Yeah, that's right. That's what he's called us to be. Yeah. That's why this church ain't sitting inside no more. Mm -hmm. On Saturdays, we're going to get out. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine, you know, can I, I take the Sunday service, we're going to cancel it, we're going to go out into the mission field. We're going to start missionary work right here. Mm -hmm. Every Saturday. I mean, I, say, I keep saying every Saturday. Lord, <laughs> you, know, every <laughs> you never know, you never know. You want to be with the church. The church ain't inside. The church is outside. You're going to find out, watch, that through what's about to happen, God's going to open up ministry opportunity for each and every one of you. Because you're going to get to meet people and know people and all of this kind of stuff. And they're going to be asking you about what's going on. That's the word of the Lord right now. If you want to feed them then, you need to feed them now. That's right. I want to feed him then. Amen. Whether I'm in a concentration camp or not. Amen. And whatever I open my door to, I got to be fully persuaded that whatever happens to me, he's got to pass through his hands first. Amen. That's where you need to be. 
It's where you need to be so that you don't miss out on what it is that God has called you to do. Your greatest ministry opportunity might be in the prison camp. We say, Lord, you know, I just want to do what it is that you've called me to do. Well, the Gestapo's outside, open your door, they're going to take you to prison. Uh, I know that ain't you, Lord. Get the guns. Let me tell you something. You're already dead. Amen. Amen. The hiding place, the only hiding place that you and I have is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, brother. Don't ever forget it. Amen. No matter where we at, no matter where we go, no matter where he takes us, our hiding place is Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen, brother. He is our strong tower. Amen. He is. Right? He is our refuge. He is our peace. Amen. Amen. Just so you'll know, today is very important. It's Pentecost. Amen. And I'm so glad the Lord spoke to us. Amen. So important was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So important was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was so that they can do what the Father had called them to do. You've heard of the latter rain? Yeah. Yeah. Well, guess what? It's about, it, it's about to be poured out. That's right. Watch. Not only was it that he was going to make them witnesses, but also they had to be empowered to walk out what it was that God had called them to do. You got to remember something. What was happening then? They were being persecuted. They were being killed. They were being martyred under Rome. Not only under Rome, but under Rome in religion. Amen. They died not as heroes, but of enemies of the state. Because the new law said that, you know, if you believe in Jesus and carry a Bible and have a gun, well, then that makes you, you know, a terrorist. That's right. We see in Acts chapter 4, verse 29, and so I quote verse 20 now, verse 29. So I'm bringing you to what was going on then so you'll understand because what was then is coming now. And this is what he said. This is Acts 4, verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Wow. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done in thy name of thy holy son, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled. Why were they assembled? Maybe it was because of fear. Right? They were scared. What was the prayer about? Boldness. They were fearing. But they had to be endued with power to be able to preach the word with boldness. Amen. So that when they come, like Paul said, you know, the prophet said, as I've tied this man's hands with this, so you're going to be. He says, what does Paul say? Yeah, okay, shall I not go to Rome? This guy's going to the lion's den. Shall because of what you said is a truth. Shall I not go because of God has called me to go someplace and do something. Shall I fear what man is going to do unto me or God? He had a purpose. The last message I ministered before I left you guys was, remember it was the, um, the last words of dying men. And what were they? Keep the faith. Amen. Endure. Persecutions. Never thought about it like that before. Not because I did, but not like when you're taken there, when you read the book, The Hiding Place, you go to that place, you put yourself in Corey Ten Boone's place, and then you begin to think, could I have endured that? Come on. 
Do you have that faith? Come on, brother. Because this is the crowning of what God, the capstone of what God wants you to have settled within you. Right. Yes, you're a Christian. Yes, you might have put some rice and vittles away. That's okay. But are you fully persuaded that no matter what you go through, that you're going to endure? Amen. It says, and a multitude of them that had believed were of one heart, and they're of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of these things which we possess, or they're our own, but they all had everything in common. I want you to think about something. When it turns loose, and it is shortly, You think you're going to be concerned about the things that you have? That's why the scripture was here like this. Because they were searching them out to kill them. You think they worried about what they owned? No. Now you can understand what's going on here. Because it's, it's exactly what's about to happen here in the United States of America. Do you realize that? All of the stuff that's going on right now, you think it's by chance? I heard last night, um, Billy Graham's daughter. You guys know her? Ann Graham? Anna, what's that? Ann Graham Lotz. Ann Graham Lotz. She put a warning out yesterday. Not only yesterday, has been now for weeks and weeks, Ann Graham, about what's about to happen. These are people that, you know, are high up in a chain that are saying this place is finished, basically. And if you can't see it, I want to tell you another thing. Um, when I was up there, it just so happens the second day that I'm up there, I go, I get up early in the morning, I go down to the restaurant, it opens early about 6.30 down in the little uh, cafe they got at the, at the hotel. And while I was there, I met a man. He walked in and sat down at the table and I was reading. And when I looked up, he had a World War II hat on. And I was like, you know, how you doing? His name was Ralph Rogers. So if you see this, Mr. Ralph, you'll remember. Ralph Rogers. Um, I said, you was in World War II? And um, he was 89 years old, and he kind of shook his head, and, and uh, I said, that's kind of crazy, because I'm reading a book you know, right now by, you know, Corey Ten Moon. She was in a concentration camp, you know, for 11 months. He said, so was I, a prisoner of war. For two days, I sat down with that man, and he told me, exactly what he went through there for four months. This man's probably about 6'2 or 6'3. You know, he's kind of, he's a tall man. When he came out of the camp, he was 87 pounds. Prisoner of war. He said what they ate was black bread, turnips, and black bread, turnips, and potatoes. He got three potatoes a day, this big. Three potatoes. Black bread. It was called black bread because the, the bread was solid black and it was stamped on the bread 1941 and he was eating it in 1944. You know what's crazy? That's exactly what's in Corey Ten Boone's book. I said that's exactly what Corey Ten Boone said. Not only, not only did God lead me to the book and have me read it, but he led me to a, a, a person that was actually there. He brought him to me. Brought him to me. And then, how crazy is this? In all of Tennessee, we go to a certain place and run into him. Amen. And he, not once, twice. I'm sitting down in the chair watching some stuff, you know, going on, and all of a sudden I get a pull on the back of my chair, and I turn around, it's him. You know, and then a little while later, run into him again. 
And, and in the next day, the lady, which I thought was his wife, I found out his wife had died three years ago. It was just a friend of hers. She's like, what could this possibly mean that, you know, um, that, you know, we keep running into you? And I said, it's, it's about Jesus. You know? But it, it had a meaning. Amen. And this is the preparation that God, the last part of the preparation, which what I think that you and I need. You know, it's... Uh, Rebecca came in this morning right after Deke. Um, actually, Pete was here first doing his, uh, Pete was vacuuming. He was doing exactly, he said, I'm doing exactly what my wife told me to do. I said, Pete, you don't have to vacuum. He said, look, I learned, son. That's what he told me, I learned. And he vacuumed, too. He said, I learned, you know, I, I do what I'm told. Pete's a good man. And Rebecca said she was coming home the other day from Jackson, and she was in the midst of a big storm, and uh, she had she was singing a song that um, that really changed her life. Is that not right? Yeah. When mercy found me, and as she's singing this song in the car, there's a truck and another car in front. They uh, the rains pour and they lock up the brakes and all that. These two cars in the front, they go off the side of the road. They get a flat, and she just goes right through it. And she said, "I can't believe, you know." She said uh, that as I was driving, I was singing this worship song, but God gave me total peace right through it in the midst of a storm. Exactly what we're going through. We can have peace in it. So, uh, being able to endure all things, I'm done. This is what the Lord told me to uh, tell you guys. That we need to be able to endure all things. Um, having it settled in your heart and your mind. And remember, if God set Israel free, parted the Red Sea, rose Jesus from the dead, and literally countless miracles that the Bible says you can't even record in the books. I think that He can preserve you and me. But, if He doesn't, kind of sound like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But if He doesn't, O King, I'm still, and I want you to look at me good, I am still, we are not going to bow down to your image. Never. Ever. And I want to read this last scripture to you. Romans 8. If you have your Bibles, you can, uh, you can go to it. Corey Ten Boom really gave me the understanding of this of this scripture. Um, if you would like to see any of her, um, I encourage you guys to go on YouTube. She's all over YouTube. You can watch literal, you know, her talking personally and um, little, teachings and little teachings and stuff. Of and she's always bringing you back to where she was. But in Romans chapter eight. It says, Romans 8, 35. We hear this scripture, it's very familiar. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You got to remember, I realized through Corey and her writings, and you will too, that the only thing that can separate you from the love of Christ is you. Is you. And I want to read this to you. Because I learned it through Corey when she was in that concentration camp. Many people denied the faith. So you are able to separate you from the love of God. Watch. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? <clears throat> He's asking a question. Are you going to let tribulation or distress or persecutions 
or famine or nakedness or peril or sword that is what she went through all of them Corey Ten Boone and many others she was naked stripped right everything that's there famine nothing to eat persecution right beat as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter we are accounted it's already it's already been done you are accounted as sheep to the slaughter you're already dead Amen. the only way we're gonna do what it is that God has called us to do is to for you and me to already have that settled within you settle it now nay he says nay in all things we are more than conquerors through him that love us for I am persuaded for I am persuaded you have to be persuaded that no matter if you're sitting on the train and dung if you are ate up with fleas and ticks and lice if you got a disease that's gonna kill you you need to be fully persuaded that God is still good Amen. 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 for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers governments nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature wow oh yeah you're gonna see some creatures Amen. you're gonna see some hybrids <laughs> creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord and I close and then I'm gonna come to you remember the only one that can separate you from the love of God he'll always love you but to be able to separate you from his love means that you can't be with him don't you want to be with the one you love come on, brother. I can separate my love from my wife by simply running around right she doesn't want that because she loves me but I can make it happen and I will not make it happen so you can separate yourself this is actually from the Fox Book of Martyrs I've read this before maybe one of you guys have heard it I think uh, Carol uh, had given it to me it seems like something that would be from her the communist soldiers had discovered their illegal Bible study. Now think about this. This is, anyway. As the pastor was reading from the Bible, men with guns suddenly broke into the home, terrorizing the believers who had gathered there to worship. The communists shouted insults. This is true. This was uh, in Asia in 1970, in the 1970s. This is actual truth from the Fox Book of Martyrs. I've read it there. This was in the 1970s from a girl that was 16 or 17 years old. The communist soldiers had discovered their illegal Bible study. They will be illegal. When Germany took over, there was no phones, no radios, no Bibles. No organized meetings. For years, secret as the pastor was reading from the Bible men with guns suddenly broke into the home terrorizing the believers who had gathered there to worship the communists shouted insults and threatened to kill the Christians the leading officer pointed his gun at the pastor's head hand me your Bible he demanded if you can pry it out of my cold dead hands <laughs> Reluctantly, the pastor handed over his Bible. You realize that's his birthright. That was his birthright. His prized possession. 
With a sneer on his face, the guard threw the Word of God on the floor at his feet. He glared at the small congregation. We will let you go, he growled. But first, you must spit on this book of lies. Anyone who refuses will be shot. The believers had no choice but to obey the officer's order. A soldier got up. A soldier got up and knelt down by the Bible. Reluctantly, he spit on it, praying, Father, please forgive me. You're soldiers in the army of the Lord. He stood up and walked to the door, and the soldiers stood back and allowed him to leave. Okay, you, the soldier said, nudging a woman forward in tears. She could barely do what the soldier demanded. She spit only a little bitty bit, but it was enough. She too was allowed to leave. Quietly, a young girl came forward. Overcome with the love of her Lord, she knelt down and picked up the Bible. She wiped the spit off with her dress. What have, what have you done? No, what have they done to your word? She said. Please forgive them, she prayed. The communist soldier put the pistol to her head and pulled the trigger. Most of these facing persecution to today could have escaped if they had denied their faith. The question is not whether we are persecuted, but whether we are willing to lay down our life for Jesus Christ, Amen. for the faith that we believe in. Jesus willingly laid down his life for you and me because of his love for us. You must lay down your life a living sacrifice. Father, you're good, Lord. Lord, you're good. And Father, we thank you for that it's by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you poured out on the day of Pentecost, Lord. That, Lord, just as in Acts chapter 4, Lord, you empowered them to be able to preach the gospel with boldness, Lord. You know the times that we're facing. And Father, I don't want to be one that runs and hides. Lord, I want to be in your will, Father, and I want to do your will. If that costs me my life, Lord. But Father, I pray, Lord, that your spirit, Father, would just be poured out on us, Father, so that we can endure. Lord, that we won't be the ones that will fall back, Lord. But Lord, that we will finish the race that's been laid out for us, Father. And Lord, I was even told, um, Father, that Paul, Lord, when he was being brought to be beheaded, Lord, that he ran to, uh, Lord, where they was going to kill him, where he was going to be a martyr. He ran to it, Father. Lord, let us be, Father, so brave as to run to ours, Father, if you've called us for that. Lord, we can only do it by your Spirit. And we know, Father, that just as you've poured out your Spirit, the early rain, that, Father, in the latter, you're going to pour it out even greater. And we thank you for your Spirit, Lord. On this day of Pentecost, where the whole house shook and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Lord, came down. Father, I pray right now that your Spirit, Father, would empower each and every one of us that's in here. Not only in here, in these walls, but your bride to do, Father, what it's been called to do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. and amen.